Yeah, so like Wolfgang said, I'm going to be talking about uh, travel today. So this is much like Zach's presentation. This is the last work of one of my uh, recently graduated master's students who couldn't make it to the conference, so I'm presenting the work on her behalf. Um, so there's been a lot of recent interest in the VRL. Maybe I'll just kind of do a show of hands. How many of you have a head-mounted display with an eye tracker built into it? It's, yeah, that's better than last year, and I think la the year before that there would have been even fewer. So these are, these are getting um, more and more common. There's been a lot of recent interest in using eye tracking in VR. Um, you know, the, the one we have in our lab, and the one that we'll, we used in our studies that I'll talk about today is the uh, FOV, which you see on the left here. Um, but, you know, th th we're not, you know, spoiler alert for our results, we're not particularly impressed with the FOV, but the, um, some of these uh, better devices out here, these different add-ons, I've heard good things about the, um, the uh, Toby add-ons for the Vive um, or the People Labs hardware. So if you have any experience with these ones, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on them later on. Um, but where this work came from was, uh, this is motivated by the study that my uh, student Heather uh, did last year, we published in SUI last year, and with the uh, slightly cheeky title, The Eyes Don't Have It, an Empirical Comparison of Head-Based and Eye-Based Selection in Virtual Reality. So even though this is a talk on travel, as Wolfgang alluded to, I can never really quite get away from the selection stuff here. Uh, so that's exactly what we did in this, in this study last year, was looking at uh, the use of an eye tracker for selecting 3D targets in virtual reality, and again, using this FOV head-mounted display. Um, and where the, the motivation for this work came from was we were looking at devices like um, Google Cardboard or uh, even the HoloLens where they're very much, uh, er, almost all interaction is handled with this sort of head-based pointing. You're, tar you're selecting targets by aiming your head, you're uh, navigating an environment by pointing your head where you want to go. Um, and you know, we, we started looking at, well, we've got an eye tracker now in this device. Can we do any better than these head-based approaches using an eye tracker? And the eye has been used in various HCI contexts over the years for different interaction techniques. And uh, selection was one of these things that had been tried in the 2D realm in the past. And it turned out to be not so bad, um, not, you know, not to mouse level performance, but you know, not so bad. Um, so this is what we, we started thinking about uh, using this in VR, and I apologize, this video did not work properly before. I think I have to actually exit here, and then I'm just going to make this as big as I can. And I can play it here, I think it'll work, so you can just see what, the, what participants were doing in that task. But it's going to look a lot like what Zach just showed you. <laughs> um, but we were comparing head-based pointing, so this is head-based here. Uh, compared to the combination of, okay, that's enough. So this is what, what you see the participant actually doing. So eye-based selection, so the head tracker was disabled here and they were exclusively using their eyes. The targets were presented at um, both at different depths but also at split different depths, just exactly like the same, there you see it now, the same task uh, Zach used essentially. Um, to, to add this depth component to the task. Uh, and then finally, there was a uh, condition with the combination of both. So basically, we looked at the range of all of these. I'll just let this play for another few seconds just so you can see. This is the combination of the eye tracker plus the head tracker enabled. Um, so I'll move on from here. So all that said, um, our results were very disappointing. Um, we, were, we went into this hoping that we would have you know, seen that the eye might have helped us out. And, and even the, the condition that we thought might have done best, allowing both the eye and the head to work in tandem, turned out to actually be the middle one. <laughs> and the one that worked best turned out to be the uh, head track condition, and the eye did the worst overall on its own, which was, uh, we were surprised by this, and Heather was pretty disappointed. Um, so we took another stab at this uh, and thought, well, what about different interaction scenarios in VR? Can we do better? And uh, started th and just like Zach showed in the last slide, so thanks for going before me, Zach, because I can <laughs> keep referencing you. Uh, you know, we, we often look at VR interaction as breaking down into these different categories, and selection is just one of these things, manipulation is another. Travel seemed like the next obvious thing to try for um, eye-based interaction in VR. So this is um, one good reason for this. We thought this might do 
better or we might get better results with eye tracking for travel is you, you tend not to have as high an accuracy requirement in travel as you do with selection. It's usually good enough to kind of get into the general vicinity of where you want to be and then maybe you're, you know, maybe you're following up this travel task with a manipulation task or something like that but usually you have these, you can perform these subtle maneuvering tasks and things like that that um, in a sense you don't have to be as precise as selecting a, you know, a, a one centimeter target in a space. So we were a little optimistic that uh, the eye tracker may do a little bit better in this realm. Um, so we were also thinking um, travel typically involves about three or four steps. You generally look where you want to go. Maybe you turn your head in that direction as two. Maybe you do these two things simultaneously, which is why I say there's three or four steps here. Uh, in VR, you generally then point some kind of controller where you want to go, and you can see this shown in the, the figure here, and then you press a key to either move along that ray or, um, or teleport yourself there or something like this. Um, what we were interested in with eye tracking is you can actually do this potentially in fewer steps. Maybe you just look where you want to go and you press a key and whoosh, off you go. And that's where the, the title of the paper came from, uh, Look to Go. This was kind of what we were trying to, trying to figure out if this... Um, interaction metaphor actually works. So to give you a bit of background, um, so a little bit of related work on previous navigation. This, um, ta this study done by Nelson et al, this is uh, pretty old now, but um, they were using this hoop flying task, so flying through these uh, 3D rings in space. And this is actually what inspired our first user study task that you'll see uh, shortly. Uh, another study done more recently, Chan et al. looked at um, head and joystick based travel and this is worth mentioning here um, because our, we include a head based travel technique in our study but also joystick based travel techniques. So what they were doing was uh, moving through a cave by using their head to control their movement direction but also a joystick and what they found was um, the uh, head based paradigm actually was better than the joystick, both in terms of user performance, um, presence levels, uh, and also l reduced cyber sickness. So anybody who's re regularly used a joystick in a VR environment wouldn't be surprised by that last result because once you start using a joystick in VR, you're introducing these visual vestibular conflicts that make you sick. Um, moving on to eye tracking in VR, there's uh, probably the, the best example of um, the use of eye tracking in VR is for this foveated rendering. Um, so this idea that you don't need to render the whole scene in high detail necessarily, or you can render, render things away from your foveal view in uh, lower resolution because you don't need to see it in high detail anyway. And so this is probably the most common application or the most common usage of eye trackers in VR right now. So not so much a, in it for an interaction technique or to interact with the environment, it's sort of this um, display technique. I mean, I, I guess other people are using this for, uh, you know, knowing, knowing where the user is looking. So not, again, not really an interaction type thing, but in these sort of UX type realms where you, you know, sometimes you want to know, are people looking at this icon or that icon? This, this kind of thing can be done in VR as well. Probably the closest work to our own was uh, by uh, Stelmach and, and Dachsel um, on basically also using the eye or using an eye tracker to navigate a virtual environment. This was a little bit more indirect than what we were looking at. And essentially the users were sort of looking at um, kind of a 2D UI over top of the environment. And so sort of I look over here and then gaze at the left button to go left sort of thing. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, this is about as close to our study as we've found in our, in our uh, literature search on this. So we also looked at some uses of eye tracking in uh, 3D games, because I don't think anyone would argue that games aren't similar to VR, especially these days. Um, so one example, this comes from Isakoski and Martin, this uh, penguin hunting game. Now, it's worth noting that even though you had to move through the environment, much like most first-person shooter games here, they were using the eyes to actually target and, uh, and, and you know, shoot these penguin icons in the environment. So uh, it's really more like a selection task, so in, in a sense more similar to our previous study on this. Um, another example was uh, from Smith and Graham who used an eye tracker in several different games including uh, uh, Quake 2 I believe this was, uh, Neverwinter Nights, this was 2006, these are pretty old games now, and, um, and a sort of missile defense game. 
And each of these ones, they use the eye tracker differently. So for Quake 2, um, it's actually probably the closest example to what we're doing here, where they were using the eye, eye tracker to control the movement through the environment. It's essentially, look to the side to make the player rotate in one direction or another and then move along. Um, in Neverwinter Nights, they kind of looked at where they wanted to move the player in the environment. So more, again, kind of like a selection task. Um, and the last one, with the uh, missile defense, they were basically tracking moving targets with the eyes. But again, the Quake 2 example is probably closest to ours. Um, overall, their results showed that in all these games, in all these tasks, the eye tracker tended not to do as well as the mouse, um, but their participants seemed to like it more and found it kind of interesting and they found it more immersive. So there's some promise there even if we can't get you know, quantifiable objective performance improvements. So in terms of our current study, uh, we had two experiments we did, one flying and one walking. Uh, and really the, the overall objective here, as I, I mentioned earlier, was to see can, can we do any better in, a, in travel tasks than we did in selection <laughs> using the eye. Um, so experiment one, uh, we had 14 participants. Uh, some of these had some prior experience with eye tracking. Uh, lots of them had prior VR experience. I guess this is the side effect of being in an HCI department is people are starting more and more to see these things. Um, none of them, I think uh, actually most likely some of these had actually done the study from the year before, which is probably why they had eye tracker experience. Um, the hardware being used was a VR capable laptop, not unlike this one here. Uh, I mentioned before that we used the FOVE head mounted display here, which includes an integrated eye tracker. There's more details on the FOVE in the paper if you're curious to know about its technical specifications. Uh, we used an Xbox controller for its joystick, and this was all done in Unity. The task, um, you can see the, the uh, task is shown to the right here, this circle of rings, and as I mentioned, the, the idea was um, the closest ring or the next ring in sequence was highlighted in red and participants were instructed to try to fly through that ring uh, and then the rings were configured in sort of this spiral configuration and then there'd be another spiral in the opposite direction and the reason for this was that um, participants were always kind of moving in a different direction so we kind of balanced out any effects of directionality here by having them go in a different direction each time in this ring. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the uh, deviation of the rings was changed as an independent variable. So uh, it was either 10, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, or 30 degrees away from the previous ring just to make it the task easier or harder as they flew along. Um, the uh, independent variables here, so it's a, we have uh, a seven by three within subjects design. I mentioned the difficulty already, this deviation from the previous ring. Um, the travel techniques, um, these are broken down into what Heather calls um, single travel techniques and combination travel techniques. So the single techniques are these eye only, head only, mouse only, joystick only. So in these cases, uh, we had disabled the head tracker. And again, this was to get it if there's any effect of um, using the eye with the head or using the eye independent of the head. Uh, we thought it was only fair to balance that with the other techniques too, the head, the mouse, and the joystick. So then we have um, each of these techniques plus the head tracker enabled as well. Um, the dependent variables recorded include uh, completion time, success rates, collision radius, travel performance, that sub should be subjective, uh, subjective travel performance levels, TLX and SSQ. Uh, so overall this worked out to about 7,000 trials. So I'm just going to again show a quick video of what this ended up looking like. Uh, and I have to, come on. So this is the uh, head-based technique. And it's just like you'd expect, you're just aiming the head. Mouse-based technique, worked like a first-person shooter game. Joystick technique, um, used the uh, joystick to control the viewpoint. Uh, and these are the ones that combine both. So this is head plus eye, so they're using both the eye and the head tracker, or head tracking here. You can see it's jumping a little bit when they're using the eye tracker here. And you get the idea. <coughs> 
So in terms of results, um, overall the joystick techniques did pretty badly. Uh, just to explain what these graphs are showing, these little braces at the top are kind of showing, uh, call them statistical clusters, if you will. So um, what, what this is showing on the uh, completion times, for example, is that there's no difference or no significant difference between the two joystick conditions, acro even across the three uh, difficulties, but the joysticks were significantly different from all other conditions. That's what this is showing. Um, the uh, head plus mouse technique, which is the lowest one, this is completion time, so lower is better. Uh, head plus mouse did best, which is maybe not that surprising. Um, and the eye technique, the eye only technique, was kind of in the middle. Um, and then the rest of these were sort of not different from one another, not significantly different from one another. In terms of success rates, um, really, again, the joysticks did generally worse. Um, but the, uh, in that case, the eye only technique also did a little bit worse than most of the other ones. Um, we also looked at where people were basically hitting the plane of the ring. Um, so this is uh, the, the plot on the left shows you these scatter these points where they um, hit it, and then this graph to the right shows the average uh, distance they were from the center of the rings. And again, you can see they had a hard time with the joysticks. The eye was some somewhere in the middle here, uh, and again, the mouse-based techniques did uh, best. So I'm going to go through some of these last results a little bit quicker because I think I'm a little bit tight on time here. Um, again, that's the, the price of eating into my own time with that extra question for Zach earlier. But <laughs> um, this is sub these are subjective results. So we asked people how they felt about um, you know their perceived speed, accuracy, how good their spatial awareness was, the ease of learning of the technique, and the ease of use of the technique. And again, you can see the the two rightmost bars, the pink one and the green one, are the joysticks, and they just got uh, generally slammed by the participants. They did not like these. Um, whereas, again, the eye-based techniques were somewhere in the me middle, but generally the mouse did best. Uh, generally the head-based techniques came next, followed by the eye-based techniques and the joystick at the end. Uh, in terms of SSQ, again, the joystick, joystick techniques did worst here, so higher scores are worse here. It means people felt more sick doing this. Um, and again, anyone who's used joysticks in VR, this is probably not all that surprising. Uh, the eye-only techniques, this is the eye without the head tracker enabled, uh, also did pretty badly, um, which is also maybe not a surprise. Adding that head tracker in helps provide um, consistent uh, visual vestibular information. Um, I think I'll just skip past the TLX here. Uh, experiment two. So uh, in this one, we had 12 participants. Um, I, if I remember correctly, and I think it says this in the paper, some of these people, but I don't remember the exact number, did the uh, other study as well. The apparatus was the same as in the first study. Um, the task this time was a more, call it a more realistic sort of VR travel task involving walking along, uh, walking along the ground in a virtual environment. And the software presented these, uh, you can see this red post on the left figure, so there was a sequence of these posts and the next one in the sequence would always appear red and participants were instructed to travel to that red post and then the next one in the sequence and so on. Uh, and we did this both with and without obstacles. So you see the uh, figure on the right shows this uh, tire in the way and that's, these are the obstacles. There'd be a couple of these. Participants couldn't pass through these things. Uh, we didn't count how often they bumped into them or anything like that because we felt it actually uh, fundamentally changed the task enough to force them to avoid these obstacles. There was really no reasonable way to compare the no obstacle and the obstacle conditions. So we, we analyzed these separately in the results. Um, the task ended up looking like this. And again, I have to uh, jump out of here for a second. So pretty standard VR travel. They have to move along and they, oh, he bumped into the obstacle. And, um, the obstacles were just there again to add a little more difficulty to the task, see how people do and you know, rarely do we have a perfect travel task where we don't have anything in the way. So, uh, it was a three by two within subject design. This time we used a subset of the techniques, only used the eye only, head only, and joystick only. So that is the eye, eye tracker, head-based technique, and then the joystick one. Um, 
we, and with obstacles on and off. We looked at completion time, travel performance, and again, that's subjective, NASA TLX and SSQ. So in terms of time, um, we actually got very minimal differences in these overall um, travel tasks, or the, the, I should say the, the magnitude of the differences was small, although they were significant in the case of the obstacles conditions. Without obstacles, we didn't get significant differences between these. So apparently the, the obstacles added just enough complexity to the task to kind of parse these conditions apart a little bit. And you can see from the, uh, from the results here that um, the, uh, the head only and joystick only were different from each other and the eye only and joystick only were different from one another. And in fact, the eye only did worst overall in this study. In terms of subjective preference, uh, users really liked the head-based technique, um, but Beyond that, they tend to like the eye, on average, a little bit more than the joystick, especially around speed, accuracy, and spatial awareness. Uh, in terms of SSQ, well, again, not surprisingly, the joystick was not great here. The head did quite well, um, and the eye actually did pretty poorly as well in this case. And again, I'm going to skip past to the TLX. These, are, these results are in the paper if you're curious. So just to, to wrap up and discuss the results a little bit, um, one thing that um, Heather noticed while doing these studies was this sense that um, you know, after doing a few trials, people got better pretty rapidly. And this is often the case that you know, an un unfamiliar condition, for example, the eye tracker in our case, is going to benefit from learning more strongly than something they're already familiar with, like a mouse, for instance. So it would be nice to do a longitudinal study on this kind of thing down the road and, and see uh, if you have them you know, look to go enough, do they get good enough at it that it maybe someday gets closer to the mouse. Um, anyone who's worked with eye trackers before knows that calibration remains a major issue. Um, so this means, in our, in our case, we actually had some prospective part participants who wanted to do the study and who were disqualified because they couldn't get through the calibration process for the FOB eye tracker. So I think there was, a, we had a, a few of those. Um, they couldn't calibrate in, in more than five tries at calibration. And then we had situations where we had to recalibrate the eye tracker throughout the study and otherwise um, it just, it drifts too much. Uh, I mentioned cyber sickness a few times here. So we didn't actually use any techniques to try to reduce this. Uh, and I'll, I'll shamelessly plug my other students work here on, uh, on cyber sickness. The reference is provided here if you're curious, but um, this is a you know, well-known issue in, in VR even to this day. And it seemed that um, as, as soon as we didn't provide these consistent uh, vestibular information, in other words, in the conditions without the head tracking enabled, uh, things tended to get worse. Um, and overall, uh, like we said, like I said at the start, there's a lot of interest in eye tracking in VR right now. Um, our sense is the FOVE being kind of the, the first device to the market is probably uh, not the greatest one out there right now, and, and there'll probably be better hardware on the market in the very near future. Uh, and I know that in general, uh, eye tracking can be used effectively. We have a nice Toby eye tracker in my lab at home, and it's you know very precise, very fast, does much better than what we could do with the FOVE here, but. Um, I guess this is, this is what you get in a $500 head-mounted display, you know? So um, it seems likely that these kind of factors might start to go away as better, more expensive uh, hardware comes onto the market. Um, but even things like the weight of the head-mounted display, how the headband is designed, all these things even seem to matter a little bit. It's one thing Heather noted while, while doing the study was that um, depending on how they put the headband on, the, the display could shift slightly. Then all of a sudden there's your calibration gone again, you know? Um, so this is a, a, a big problem. So just to summarize, uh, we did a flying study and a walking study. In the flying study, the head-based techniques tended to do better with the eye-based techniques in the middle somewhere and the joystick-based techniques doing worse overall. In the walking study, um, the head-based techniques again did better than the joystick techniques. The eyes generally did a little bit worse, but not much worse. So um, <coughs> that's it. Um, it's, again, a little bit disappointing that we didn't get better results for the eye trackers, but anyway, I'll happy to take your questions now. Thanks. All right, questions, and I can see already some hands up. Yes, thanks for this talk. Um, I, I was curious, I didn't quite get it. How 
does the head tracking or how does the head uh, give you vestibular cues during steering during locomotion? During locomotion, it doesn't, I guess. Well, if you 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 look in the direction, but yeah. you don't get any vestibular cues like no, acceleration. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. So it's still so you yeah. still got that conflict. So the 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 observations you made. Does it mean you didn't you had head tracking completely switched off? So you were for the, for wearing the an HMD without head tracking? With the conditions without the head tracker, yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. For the conditions with the head tracker enabled, it was turned on as normal. Okay. Did, do you uh, find that comfortable? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. But this was, uh, like I say, this was this yeah. was intended to kind of look to at this. Show that it doesn't. Compre <laughs> well, not not so much that we we I mean we expected that to be the outcome, right? Uh -huh. um, but we we wanted to be comprehensive in in mm -hmm. if we were looking at eye versus head. Like, I guess you could say it goes back to the original study we did last year, right? We had we had um, eye only, head only, and then the Compromise technique with both of them enabled. So we, we want, kind of wanted to keep this mm -hmm. um, the same sort of design this time around. Okay, so that makes sense. And regarding the the results on the eye tracking, uh, it looks like uh, what you what you observe doesn't really match your hypothesis. No. And, uh, <laughs> and perhaps that's simply a technical issue. Could be. So um, so we don't. So I'm, I'm just wondering how far can we extrapolate from these results. Um, I think, well, for one, you, I think you can extrapolate that you wouldn't want to use the FOVE in particular in, uh, in, these, kinds of ta in these kinds of tasks. But like I say, I, I wonder um, results may change with new hardware. Um, I would actually be, something I should maybe get, a, get doing is uh, using that nicer Toby tracker we have and seeing if we can do any better in that sense. But um, yeah, so th this is, yeah, it's a re reasonable comment. So thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> um, uh, as I observed the results, I think that um, the mouse performed quite well in a lot of tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and if I go through this process, then basically um, you will fixate on an object, mm -hmm. you move the mouse, and then you click. Yeah. And my, I guess my question is, why did you not compare gaze and clicking? Because essentially, <coughs> fixation would be there on the object and then you could click the button and you don't have the delay of the motoric action of the hand. So, sorry, say that, so gaze at the target and then click the mouse to go? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, we could have done that too. Yeah, that's... Um, and the second question is maybe it's also regarding how the eye works and the, the precision of the eye. Mm -hmm. I think you might consider having dynamic targets as well. You mean like moving ones? Moving targets, yeah, yeah because the eye is much faster yep. in, in picking these up. Yeah, that would be a, a, a nice topic for a future study. Unfortunately, the students graduated, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can find Need someone more else. more students. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Frank? Maybe I missed that. Um, it looks in the first experiment that only in the joystick condition they had control over their own speed, whereas in all the other conditions it was yeah. like continuous movement. And it also looks pretty fast. Yeah. The acceleration. This was something. So, so to answer your first question, um, they basically when you you press the mouse button you would move forward. Um, but I believe, I think. Actually, maybe that's what she did do, was what you were asking earlier about clicking the, I think it was, she clicked the mouse to go forward in all the conditions except the joystick one, then they used the joystick to rotate the viewpoint and pressed a button. But I, I don't know why that, that shows through in the video. Um, that you, Again, you see a little bit of this sort of jerky kind of motion only in the joystick, which maybe influenced things. But, um, and your other question was? Uh, I don't think you answered. Oh, OK. No, it looked, uh, the, the video, the, the joystick one, well, they, they were all they were all consistent with speed. Um, yeah, it was and this was one of these things where she pilot tested on a few people in the lab and you know, they like the speed, like that speed, and kind of figured out what that speed she thought seemed useful. Okay, I can do this. But. So, yeah, um, go ahead, quick. Yeah. 
very old uh, study from Bowman and colleagues mm -hmm. where they also looked at, um, I think it was hip or orientation and pointing orientation and also gaze yeah. um, for traveling and they basically ruled out uh, gaze uh, uh, oriented uh, or gaze based steering because you generally during steering you want to look around and yeah. use that modality for something else. So based on that study, I would have expected you maybe to look more into like more modern navigation techniques using jumping, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Did you consider that? Um, not not in this study, no. Um, you know, this, like I say, this was kind of just the the first sort of obvious, I think, <laughs> things we wanted to try out. But I mean, these are, again, jumping and other similar interactions would be worth looking at in the future. Thank you. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker again.